This paper is intended to provide an update to work that Rusi conducted in 2020, uh, looking at both Russian and Chinese uh, combat air and ground-based air defense threats, rather than rehash what is a flanker, what is an S-400 system, and how do they work. Uh, this is a shorter form piece, which aims to chart the uh, degree of change and the direction of change in both the threat that Russian forces can pose to Western air power capabilities and also the threat that Chinese forces can pose to Western air power capabilities. Clearly, the uh, degree of change in the Russian armed forces has been driven significantly by combat experience in Ukraine, uh, and the report uh, details some of that. Uh, and then also, of course, from the Chinese point of view, we've seen uh, a real transformation in the PLAAF and uh, PLANAF uh, capabilities in the last five years. So Air superiority for the United States even is by no means guaranteed anymore within around a thousand kilometers of the Chinese mainland in any direct conflict with China. Both the scale and also the quality of uh, Chinese equipment, purchases, weapons, aircraft fielding over the past five years is, is pretty staggering. In some areas, they're, particularly in air-to-air -air missiles, they're actually starting to outstrip uh, certain areas of American capability even. Uh, for regional uh, powers such as Japan or Australia, that's obviously um, even more concerning than for the United States that has the luxury of, of oceanic buffer areas, if you like, and, and vastly greater resources and, and larger forces. Um, but also that for those of us in looking at Russia as a primary threat in Europe, the scale of the threat that Chinese forces now pose to uh, US military options in the Indo-Pacific is such that it will absorb so much US resource from pretty much here on out even before we get into a major conflict, and certainly if we do get into a major conflict in the Indo-Pacific, that there will be precious little American capability available to rush into Europe if there is then a concurrent or a uh, sort of sequential threat from Russian forces directly against a NATO member. Uh, so that Russian air threat, which is more serious than it was uh, in early 2022 before the, the invasion of Ukraine, is one that we also increasingly will have to deal with in Europe without the US doing the majority of the, the, the work, as it were, for us. Uh, and so it's important to understand not just that that threat remains there, but also how it's evolved over the last five years. The focus that I would suggest policymakers would be wise to, to take in looking at the challenges to Western uh, air power and, and therefore Western military capability are quite different if you're looking at Russia and Europe versus uh, a Chinese military potential threat in the Indo-Pacific. In Europe, fundamentally, while Russian air power uh, itself, so Russian fighter aircraft, air-to-air -air munitions, uh, long-range air-launched uh, strike options, are more capable and in some cases more numerous than they were before February 2022, and certainly a lot more combat experienced, the primary threat to Western air power in a Russian NATO context remains the ground-based air defenses, and so the priority should still be the bolstering of suppression and destruction of enemy air defenses capabilities, especially relevant munitions for the destruction of enemy air defenses task, um, the vast majority of which in NATO currently reside in the United States uh, rather than European members. For the Indo-Pacific challenge, uh, the, the part of the takeaway is that there are no easy options here. There is no quick fix not just the growth in Chinese forces that we've seen over the past five years, but also the rates of production today, which mean that the, that growth will continue at a very rapid rate over the rest of this decade, mean that I, I don't see much other option than for the United States and other uh, allied nations that are significantly concerned with the risk of a major conflict with Chinese forces in the Indo-Pacific in the coming years to dedicate really significantly increased resources to funding their Air Force programs both in terms of platform modernization, purchasing of fifth generation uh, and potentially next generation combat air aircraft, but particularly, uh, if anything, the, the, the funding of significantly increasing the stockpiles and the capability of air-to-air -air weapons. Uh, because in the past two or three decades, the West really hasn't been significantly challenged in an air-to-air -air context in any shooting war uh, since 1991 at least. And so typically what you've seen is investment not always enough, but what investment has been put into Air Force weaponry has gone into air-to-surface munitions. Uh, and while there has been some development in air-to-air -air munitions, uh, we've seen uh, with the development, for example, of the Chinese PL-15, PL-16, soon to be in service, and PL-17, uh, very long-range air-to-air missiles, uh, the results of essentially falling behind in air-to-air -air munitions. It's not just quality, it's also quantity. Um, 
not an easy fix and one which I think will require significantly greater resource being put into control of the air as a primary task rather than just trying to be smarter with the way that we use existing money. Uh, sometimes the only solution to these scale of problems is actually to spend significantly more on your own answers.